thank you for joining me in this, uh, uh, for this lecture uh, on a Thursday afternoon. So welcome to this welcome or welcoming lecture. As the title of my presentation uh, made clear, I will be talking about well, discourses of legitimation in the news using as a case uh, the economic crisis in Greece uh, and focusing on the special role of uh, our news sources in legitimating discourses. So I will, I'll bet briefly, try to touch upon all these elements. Uh, I should mention that I have been conducting research in relation to how the social reality regarding the economic crisis in Greece has been constructed uh, by uh, media, by Greek media since 2011-2012. Um, well, I am from Greece, as you may know, so I have a genuine interest uh, in these issues. Um, and I have been uh, conducting research together with some other colleagues, first on the framing of news related to the economic crisis uh, in Greece, uh, and later I moved on to uh, the investigation of discourses of legitimation on how um, political decisions often contested uh, are legitimated regarding the economic crisis and how the economic crisis should be handled uh, are legitimated in the news. Um, lately, I have been, uh, I have focused on the special role of news sources in legitimating um, controversial political decisions, but also authority positions. And I have been conducting research with uh, Angeliki Vubuka, who is a researcher in Greece. I would like to uh, start first by briefly discussing how journalists uh, attempt to uh, build, uh, to construct their, uh, their authority as uh, the, the professionals who have the jurisdiction to, dis, uh, to collect packets in certain ways and disseminate information about current affairs in the form of news. Um, they do uh, uh, through objectivity to a large degree, but things are a bit more complicated in the sense that news uh, actually is a product of uh, a, a tension, an inherent tension between its factual and its narrative logics. News is uh, based on facts, but it cannot be reduced to facts. And at the same time, it cannot be uh, reduced to narrative, to fiction. And actually, uh, journalists uh, try to cope with this inherent, tech, in, this inherent tech, uh, tension uh, in their work. Um, one of the many nice things that uh, Barbie Zellizer uh, has written in relation to journalistic authority uh, is this part, which I think captures well what I would like to, po uh, uh, I would like to point to in relation to how journalists build their authority. She says, journalism's presumed legitimacy depends uh, on its declared ability to provide an indexical and referential presentation of the world at hand, insisting on the centrality of reality and on facts as its carrier for maintaining a clear distinction between uh, itself and other uh, disciplines and other domains sorry, of public discourse. Journalists claim a capacity to narrativize the events uh, in the real world that distinguish them from other uh, cultural voices. Retaining an attentiveness to how things really happen as a premise by which journalism makes uh, its name. We could spend a lot of time discussing what this part says because I think it, is, it condenses a lot of the, the elements uh, or uh, dimensions of the journalistic identity, but I would like to point to two things which I think are mostly relevant to uh, what I would like to point to. So uh, the centrality of facts uh, and, um, uh, and the narrativization of facts uh, by journalists, Sorry. which actually re uh, is related to, as I said, to this uh, dual uh, nature of news as facts and stories, uh, and actually 
if we relate it to how journalists attempt to build and uh, maintain their authority, uh, is they, uh, that they do so as um, uh, I, they would like to call themselves objective storytellers, which I think uh, entails an inherent contradiction. And for this purpose to, uh, to produce or to reach the ideal of the objective narrative, of the objective news narrative, and, and to, pro to produce objective uh, news stories, uh, they have uh, developed uh, conventions of form and style, like, for example, the inverted pyramid, uh, which prioritizes what is considered to be the most important, uh, or uh, the use of news sources, which is crucial, how news sources are used, uh, and uh, uh, how they are even quoted in the news text. And this is an attempt by journalists to um, take a distance between the facts that they cover, the events they cover uh, and present, and, um, uh, and themselves. And uh, they argue that while well, we use sources, we do not, um, uh, we are not, uh, we are, based only around, sen around senses to report uh, on the facts on, or events, uh, but we use sources uh, who are close to the events and they give us the information. Uh, another convention is the famous separation of facts from opinions, but all these conventions to deal with the, well, the factual narrative uh, logics of news, I think, creates other contradi contradictions and tensions. For example, in relation to the separation of facts from opinion, um, we do see often that uh, the news sources, especially the, el the elite uh, news sources, when they are presented as uh, news stories, um, their opinion is very often treated as fact. So the famous separation of fact from opinion, we see that uh, it does not apply in practice in many different ways. Also, what we see uh, is that certain types of news sources, of sources dominate in the news at the expense of others, uh, and um, they are close to what we call uh, uh, the elite institutions, mostly the political elite, but not exclusively. And uh, they are treated as privileged actors in the news, which has a number of uh, repercussions, a number of implications, because they do not only uh, give the information right, to the journalists journalist to report on the news, but with the information they provide their preferred or suggested interpretative framework, right? how uh, the information and the, uh, the events that uh, uh, are presented in its case uh, should be uh, presented that shouldn't be interpreted. And from what we have seen through our different, uh, different studies from different approaches in different countries is that it's very often these interpretative frameworks uh, are adopted by journalists, at least in mainstream media. And through their privileged presence in the news, these actors have the opportunity also uh, uh, not only to provide their own suggested interpretations of social reality that, of course, supports uh, their interests, but also they have the opportunity to uh, claim and legitimate their own authority. Uh, and at the same time, as I mentioned, in relation to you know, the norm or the axiom uh, of objectivity, the, the presence of institutional news sources also validates the the hegemonic, the dominant model of objective journalism. So practically, we, we witness a mutual legitimation of authority positions. Uh, okay, as I'm sure I will, I will run into time problems. I will try and pass very quickly through some parts of the presentation. Uh, I mentioned authority in a number of cases. And I, for now, I can quickly uh, mention that we can see it or we approach it uh, as, a, as a right which is socially endorsed. 
uh, or justify to exercise some form of power. There are different approaches and, and interpretations and definitions to authority, but one way or, or another, they do point to uh, the voluntary permission which is granted to the, the authority holders. Normally, authority is not granted or is not performed through force, uh, at least in democratic societies. Um, which is related actually to um, how, uh, how uh, hegemony also, hegemonic position, hegemonic discourses, uh, hegemonic ideologies uh, are uh, be becoming, become dominant uh, through consent. Crucially in building and even more so maintaining um, authority uh, uh, is legitimation, but also in establishing um, some ideologies are hegemonic. Uh, it, um, legitimation can be seen as um, uh, a generalized assumption that the, the actions of a person, of an entity, uh, institution, are desirable, proper, or appropriate uh, within some uh, constructed system of norms, values, uh, and beliefs. And you see the, uh, in the second definition, uh, it is mentioned that uh, it, it is related to processes and practices um, of beneficial, ethical, uh, or acceptable action in specific settings. So legitimation is uh, context-related, context-sensitive. Uh, in relation to something else, Nico, yesterday mentioned that context matters. Context matters here as well. Um, this is why uh, even when legitimation uh, is established in one occasion or in one setting, um, it is not guaranteed that it will be maintained later. Uh, or um, it can be established in a different, uh, within the same actors and the same arguments in a different, uh, let's say, cultural or social, social, social environment. Um, and of course, the news media do act as privileged spaces of legitimation, right, of discourses, but also of authority positions, as I have briefly mentioned uh, already. And it becomes clear that uh, there's a stronger need to legitimate policies, actions, and authority positions in, in times and occasions of crisis, in our case, economic crisis, um, for a number of reasons. Um, in relation to the economic crisis in Greece, the, the, the agreements and the measures that have been taken for the implementation of the, the agreements were related to harsh measures which had uh, uh, severe uh, social repercussions, for example. Uh, in, in the economic crisis uh, showed that uh, there is a disruptive potential of uh, uh, unestablished power relations of the different political groups or socio-political groups. Um, also, the economic crisis in Greece actually uh, showed that there is a legitimation crisis at different levels. For example, we had par political parties uh, of the entire political spectrum, but, but uh, uh, more specifically, uh, socialist and left uh, parties in government uh, ad adopting and implementing harsh neoliberal measures and policies. Uh, the Greek governments, the elected Greek governments, were seen as having no power to, uh, an authority, right, to decide. And they had to, uh, to succumb to the, the creditor's power. Um, also, a number of uh, measures uh, that were voted by the Greek parliament were even contested as if, uh, as whether they were constitutional or not. So we see a legitimation crisis at different levels that affects uh, mainly the political and the economic system and its actors. But we don't have time to discuss the different approaches to discourse. Uh, but I can 
uh, briefly mention that uh, in our study we do not um, examine this course in its, let's say, micro-textual uh, and micro-contextual dimensions focuses too much on, the, on how language uh, uh, is used, uh, which we see often in linguistic approaches to discourse, but we take more, more of a meso-macro uh, approach, focusing more on, uh, on meaning, uh, how meaning is produced, and, um, and uh, well, how power relations are negotiated and the ideological implications of all these. Uh, so we approach discourse as a, an ideological system of meaning and um, as uh, Norma Ferklau uh, says, uh, discourse is a stake in social struggle but it is also a side of social struggle. This is why Within this context, we implement, uh, we use uh, critical discourse analysis uh, as it focuses uh, on the discursive practices which construct representations of the world, social subjects and relations, including power relations, and uh, the role that these practices, the dis discursive practices play in furthering the interests of particular social groups. I would say also undermining sometimes the interests of others because uh, no hegemony uh, is uh, more than parcel and temporary, as uh, Norma Ferklo argued. Trying to put uh, different pieces together in relation to what uh, Angeliki and I have been doing uh, in our study, we uh, profit for from uh, Norma Ferkel's model on how to uh, approach discourse. He argues that we need to examine three dimensions to understand how discourse functions, uh, text, or the discursive practice which in Ferkel's logic relates to the um, conditions of production and consumption of text, and the broader social practice. Uh, in our case, we do focus on the systematic analysis of uh, news related to the economic crisis uh, in Greece, uh, but we also analyze at the same time journalistic practice, which is a bit different, a bit broader than well, fair class discursive practice, because we do incorporate, um, because we do incorporate practices of news production and conventions of news culture, but we also, uh, argue that it, it includes, apart from the relations of journalists with other journalists, news sources, etc., it does involve also um, negotiation of meaning, of the meaning of the reported, the presented information, the presented news, negotiation of identities and power positions. And uh, in relation to social practice, in our study it is related to uh, cementing or destabilizing the discourses uh, about the, the economic crisis, uh, but also um, uh, the uh, um, establishment or destabilization of authority positions of and power configurations of the actors who are involved in uh, handling the, the crisis. Well, I think even if you are not interested, you must have heard or read something all these years, right, about the economic crisis in Greece. I will not go uh, in big detail, uh, but officially at least, it has been going on for, let's say, nine years. Uh, and throughout these years, we had a number of agreements on how to provide financial support and help Greece's uh, economy from collapsing. Um, why we had a number of agreements and not only one, obviously because the first one did not work. They, uh, so we had three memoranda, they're called or bailout agreements, that uh, provided uh, loans uh, uh, to Greece uh, with some terms, of course, that they needed to be implemented. Um, Greece has been blamed uh, for not uh, abiding uh, by what has been agreed. This is why the, the bailout agreements were not successful. Uh, this is one side of the story. But even the creditors, for example, the IMF, has acknowledged 
that the terms of the agreement, especially the first and the second one, were not, how to put it, uh, realistic, were not feasible. Still, um, after three, uh, at least, uh, uh, agreements, uh, loans in, in, in installment, harsh neoliberal measures all these years, um, that affected, of course, the lives of all Greeks. Um, six, if I'm mistaken, different governments, as I said, from the entire political spectrum. Um, typically, Greece has managed at the, the end of the summer of 2018 to complete the terms of the third bailout agreement and supposedly now is in the phase of, uh, well, where its economy uh, is stabilized. In principle, at least. Um, what we have studied with Angeliki is a number of news texts from the two newspapers that had uh, the time of research, the highest circulation. Um, we analyzed actually 150 news texts focusing on the special role, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, of news sources in legitimating discourses, authority positions, the journalists included. So these uh, newspapers are Tanea and Cafimerini. Am I going too fast? No. If some, at some point you need a break or there are questions, feel free. Okay. The main discourses that were identified were that of objectivation and naturalization, uh, and their mechanisms are expertise, quantification, and reification for objectivation, and uh, symbolic annihilation, mystification, and moralization for uh, naturalization. I will try, we will see how we'll go time-wise, to give uh, brief examples from the material that we analyzed to point to the, uh, what these mechanisms, uh, how these mechanisms work, uh, and how also actually they do uh, function to legitimate both the actors, uh, the news sources, but also the authority of journalists. So objectivation broadly relates to the presentation of events, opinions, and ideas as real and objective facts that can be contested. As I said, it's constructed through expertise, quantification, and reification. Uh, I think expertise is easy, a bit more straightforward to understand. We do see experts often in the news, especially when they have uh, to do the news stories uh, with uh, uh, some kind of uh, either uh, scientific or expert area in social life, political and economic life. Of course, uh, we do see a lot of experts uh, in news that relate to the economy. Um, make sense, they provide knowledge that often journalists themselves don't have, but at the same time, uh, since they are also considered not to be connected to specific interests, this is debatable in some cases, uh, they, they help the journalists uh, uh, get the stamp of objectivity, doing their uh, news reporting in an objective, detached manner, asking the experts uh, about information, uh, but also about well, their interpretation. And of course, needless to say, the, the use of experts uh, is highly instrumental. Uh, we see, it's not very difficult to see in the news text, uh, and I forgot to mention here that in our analysis, we only analyzed, we did not analyze opinion pieces, we only analyze, let's say, the neutral accounts of events or the reportage, the news reports. It is not difficult to see that they are selected, the experts, in ways that support the, well, the, uh, the view of the journalists in the newspaper. So we see here, for example, uh, there is a, 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 uh, a bank executive. This autumn, he stresses, we will be talking about a new banking system as the two main concerns of the markets, the exposure to bonds and the condition of loan portfolios will have been definitely addressed. Uh, it's the time that 
they were discussing uh, about the second bailout agreement and one of the terms was the uh, recapitalization of banks and the need to restructure the banking system in Greece. Uh, and uh, so we see here actually um, an expert uh, actually providing an estimation, a speculation, uh, and, but it is treated as a fact beyond contestation. And the whole text was written in that tone. But actually, it is an evaluation, it is speculation. And we see it very often uh, with experts and how the experts are used as sources, I mean. Uh, the second mechanism of objectivation is quantification and it concerns the use of data, numbers, uh, more as uh, Goddard says, as tools of persuasion than aids to comprehension. Uh, we see often actors using, let's say, quantified arguments to make their point. Um, for example, we see here, uh, in order to support his position that the European Central Bank has been uh, helping Greece more than another country, the president of the ECB, Mr. Draghi, reacted strongly to the criticism that he is blackmailed in Greece. Uh, he reiterated that the total exposure of the European Central Bank uh, reaches, you see, 104 uh, billion uh, or 64% of the Greek GDP, whereas three months ago, the exposure was only 50 billion. This is a country where the ECB has the greatest exposure, he said. It is the time to give some context where the, the left government of Syriza uh, was recently elected uh, and they were trying to, they were resisting to apply what had previously been agreed uh, and they wanted to rene renegotiate. Uh, also, it was the time actually that the second bailout agreement was, had expired and even took an uh, extension. So they did, let's say, limit liquidity. Uh, they would stop giving money to Greece to put pressure. This is actually what they did. But you see how you use this quantified argument to argue that no, we have been helping Greece more than any other country. The interesting thing is with this kind of logics and mechanisms that the numbers are in their absolute value or truth, if you want to use the word, are right. Especially these, these sources and these actors are very careful. He wouldn't use numbers which were not accurate. But uh, this is one thing. And it's another thing if you take some numbers or, or numbers that give part of the story and put them in, an, in a different context, then you create uh, a new reality or a new proposed interpretation, right? The third mechanism of objectivation, so we had expertise, quantification, and reification, uh, relates to well, the apprehension of, of social phenomena as if they were things, uh, as if they're not created by humans. Um, we see that often uh, in how the economy and the markets are presented. Uh, the markets are concerned. Uh, we see in the first example of uh, expertise, uh, with the restructuring of banks, the, the market's concerns will have been addressed or eased. Uh, the markets are presented as an entity outside of human agency, which even have feelings. The markets are afraid. We see often these kinds of, uh, of, uh, of words used. Um, so practically in, uh, in reification, uh, on one hand, the individual is losing agency, is powerless, powerless to battle the forces of the economy, uh, while the, the products of human activity acquire agency. So this uh, perverse logic. Um, we see here a similar example. Uh, a bank executive warned that the system's strength is limited and emphasizes the urgent need to restore peace with specific actions so as to liberate society from the fear of economic destruction and bankruptcy. So vague. Uh, so we never, were never informed in that uh, news text uh, which is this, uh, what this system is. I suppose it's the, the economic system. Um, but we are concerned, right? Its strength is limited, so we have to take action. But um, also here, you see how vague the references are. 
uh, in relation to society. Actually, both the system or, or society itself are not connected to any, they don't have any human dimension. For how long shall I speak? Okay, <laughs> then, well, mm, not everybody agrees. Uh, okay, I will, an interesting example of reification is actually how um, economic reports or other kinds of official documents are used. We see, for example, like, like the, even the, uh, the memoranda themselves, right, the bailout agreements, or to make it a bit more, um, easy to understand. We often see from the rating agencies, FITS, Sandra and Poor's, these powerful uh, agencies, reports about the economies, right? They uh, might be downgrading the country's economy, the Greek economy, the Czech economy, uh, because they see risks, or they might see potential and they upgrade, like the Czech economy, these kinds of things. And, but it is interesting how these documents are used in the news. They're used, how they are written, on one hand, but also how they're used, as if, uh, they're not written by people who hardly ever see names, and it is all, always this third person, passive voice, uh, as if um, what is written in these documents is not constructed, is not decided by humans. Who has uh, agreed upon and voted right for the memoranda and their, their, uh, the measures that need to be taken? It is politicians, right, in the different it is an Eurogroup in the different parliaments in the different countries, but it is surprising how the way that they are presented and used also in the news dissociates them as if they're not created by humans. And of course, on one hand, humans are presented as, you know, powerless uh, or with limited powers, and on, on the other hand, they are protected because they're disconnected, right, the politicians, from what they have voted for, agreed, and are implementing. And moving on to the second uh, main uh, legitimation discourse, that of naturalization. Um, it relates to the presentation of information, uh, opinions, ideas, etc., in the news uh, in ways that they are treated as, uh, present as, you know, the way things are, uh, the way to do things. They become taken for granted, and, and thus, uh, uh, are, are not questioned. And it is constructed, as I said, through symbolic annihilation, mystification, and moralization. Uh, symbolic annihilation is a term who has been used first by Gay Tachman uh, in a piece of work about the symbolic annihilation of women. It was her work in the news. So uh, symbolic annihilation, which uh, uh, is uh, performed through omission, trivialization, and condemnation uh, relates to the misrepresentation or underrepresentation of social groups uh, in the news, uh, in our case, leading often to their uh, either symbolic neutralization or disappearance. Uh, we often see sources, uh, EU or credit related sources, that uh, blame Greece for not being willing to abide by what has been agreed, right, by, uh, to, to comply. And of course, we see the domestic actors blaming each other, the different political parties of, of uh, well, destroying Greece, right? The, the opposition always blames, is blaming, because they have been also alternating in power the past eight, nine years, right? We had uh, both uh, right-wing, center, and left-wing governments. They are accusing each other of, uh, well, of uh, destroying Greece with their policies. Uh, and uh, we often see uh, through the, well, the creditors, the creditor-related sources, um, the, the focus again on, on Greece being ungrateful, uh, and um, while at the same time, very important information to understand uh, what the, the bailouts uh, are about and what they mean, what their implications will be for the, the, the Greek society, are either omitted or they are trivialized, presented as uh, information of minor importance. Uh, about trivialization, what we see uh, often is 
because practically both newspapers, at, at least towards the end, Kathmerini uh, and Danea, do not support Syriza, uh, the government that we have now. And it is interesting when Syriza was trying to present some measures that they are planning to, to take to ease uh, you know, economic pressure in some parts of society, they try to trivialize them, undermining Syriza's position as untrustworthy liars as, or, or as measures of minor importance. And they do it usually in um, not very direct ways. Uh, but what is interesting with uh, trivialization, I think, is that actually it is a common journalistic practice in the sense that when journalists cover some uh, uh, news for a while and they need to you know, move on to the new development, they tend to treat previously reported information, even if it is very important, uh, as of minor importance, right, to focus on the new development. This, on one hand, makes sense, but on the other hand, uh, when it is you know, accumulated, it creates, uh, it, it treats this previously reported information as common sense naturalized knowledge, which is an important ideological implication, I think. Uh, mystification, uh, the second mechanism of naturalization, uh, involves the, the creation of uh, of an opaque, uh, obscure, uh, discursive environment where uh, insinuations or half omitted, half explained information help to support actions and policies without involved actors having to fully explain or fully account for them. For example, uh, we have here uh, an excerpt from Tanea. Uh, EU Commissioner Pierre Moscovici said yesterday that the finance ministers and the European Commission must definitely decide on Thursday on a package of important measures for the alleviation of the Greek debt. Well, in his answer to the member of the European Parliament, uh, Nikos Hundis, he stresses that there will be measures for the debt with future policy commitments. You see, nothing, nothing specific. And this is during the time, you see, this, it was June 2018. It was the time that they were negotiating. It was the time that they decided, let's say, to give the green light that, okay, the Greek economy in August will be ready to fulfill the terms of the, of the third bailout agreement. And they were discussing what happens next. Uh, and one issue of concern uh, also by other European partners, let's say France, uh, who had proposed you had a counter proposal, which of course was not accepted by Germany, and not what uh, well, Germany suggestions were the ones that were uh, actually at the end decided, uh, was to uh, have a package of measures regarding the Greek debt, because practically the Greek debt is not viable and everybody knows it. So it will be a bomb that will explode in a few years. Uh, and they tried to push it, as they called how. how I, there was an expression to kick the ball for later in relation to that matter. So you see here, they recognize that it is important, it is an issue, of course they cannot do otherwise, but uh, nothing specific here, right? Uh, the third mechanism of naturalization uh, is uh, that of moralization. Uh, it involves it relates to language which evokes moral codes uh, and values uh, to explain a situation, a phenomenon, to argue about something. Um, very often, we would see uh, issues, values of fairness, trust, uh, patriotism, morality, and their opposites uh, in how the, uh, the news about the economic crisis and the bailouts were uh, was covered, uh, but it is interesting that we see a lot of moralizing language in a lot of also official documents that are used as sources uh, when it comes to the economy and the, the banking system. So uh, expressions like, uh, well, the, the unhealthy banking, uh, uh, banking sector sorry, needs to be sanitized and these kinds of expressions. And we see them even in official legal legally or politically binding documents. Uh, we often see a discourse of 
moralizing discourse of punishment and reward for Greece. So if Greece uh, complies, uh, it will be uh, rewarded. Otherwise, it will be punished or penalized, as they were saying. Um, and there is an example here. Most importantly, however, Mr. Regling sent a message that the European st Stability Mechanism and the chief of uh, ESM, and by extension, the European partners will not abandon Greece uh, once the program is over, right, the third uh, memorandum, right, the third bailout. If necessary, Europe is ready to help in the long run. He mentioned adding that solidarity does not end in August when it was the official exodus right, of the program. Um, in other words, the solution regarding the debt decided by the Eurogroup may not be that bold. Uh, remember I told you that they were pushing uh, for a better agreement in relation to the Greek debt, at least, uh, which didn't happen. But this shouldn't be a cause for concern, right? So, uh, because Europe will take care of Greece, if necessary, as it is a member of the family. When I was reading these statements, I, I well, somehow remember the Godfather and films and the other films that uh, uh, um, show how the discourse of the mafia. Um, I don't know why, but it felt like it. Um, and I will wrap up. So I was even quicker than I, I thought I would be. So. What we have seen also through uh, the examples that I presented is that the two discourses of objectivation and naturalization uh, as they are performed and put in practice by journalists uh, attempt on one hand to deal with this tension uh, with, uh, which st stems from the factual narrative logic of news. Um, as both discourses working together actually uh, support the ideal uh, it, because it is an ideal and the authority of the objective storyteller. Uh, somebody who tells stories, but not in an objective way. Um, so we see through objectivation and its constituents um, how objectivation is put right in the service of objectivity. We have complicated, contradictory events, uh, even speculation often, right, and predictions about the future that are treated as factual uh, objective information as uh, hard facts, hard to contest, actually. Um, while through naturalization, uh, so, so what, what cannot be presented as factual uh, uh, information, you know, hard facts, uh, is processed into, let's say, naturalized common sense knowledge. Um, and in that way, naturalization helps to create the framework within which uh, facts uh, are positioned, right, to tell the story in meaningful ways. But th the issue is that these frameworks, these meaningful, these frames of meaning, carry with them uh, also, uh, as I have already mentioned, uh, value systems, right, uh, and uh, specific ideological positions, often hegemonic. Um, Actually, I think the naturalization, naturalization or neutralization of ideologies is among the most important functions of news. Uh, because uh, when an ideology is treated, appears to be common sense, uh, it is more efficient because it is not, it doesn't appear to be an ideology. And this is an ideological effect, actually. Um, I have tried uh, to show through my presentation actually how important the role of news sources is uh, in this aspect, well, legitimated uh, the journalistic authority, the authority of uh, the involved actors, elites, elite actors mostly in relation to uh, the economic crisis in Greece, but also policies, right, um, uh, measures and decisions. Um, and how actually, uh, as I said earlier, um, the presence of news sources function in processes of inter and intra-legitimation. I think I have to stop here. 
and thank you for joining me in this lecture. Well, I had some other things to say, but I didn't want to torture you more. But if something, if you have any questions or you need to discuss further any of these points, of course, I will be happy to. Something. Thank you very much for your presentation, first of all. It was very interesting. Uh, I wonder, this question will be very practical. I wonder why did you choose uh, Pindaya and Dr. Marini? Uh, wouldn't it be interesting to go for Abhi instead of leading the newspaper and to compare different attitudes, or was it like beyond the scope of your research? Also, because the government cha increase changed, so this might be interesting. And um, second question, I really wonder and cur I'm curious about how you managed to organize your research because I guess you needed to challenge a great number of articles that were published over the crisis years. How, how did you manage to, to pick what you were looking for? Uh, yes, in relation to the uh, newspaper that mentioned Avi, it means Dawn. Uh, it is a, a newspaper that supports the left and now the government, the Syriza government. Uh, we started the research first with news framing and then we gradually moved into uh, discourses of legitimation in 2012. Uh, and um, then we decided, since we are, as you said, it, it, is, uh, it requires a number of choices to be made in relation to the media, but also how to select uh, the, new, the stories uh, and since we had started with a specific approach, methodological approach, uh, uh, we thought that it made sense instead of, of taking, uh, of uh, studying less text but broadening the scope and including more newspapers to stick to these uh, two uh, newspapers uh, because originally we studied only uh, our original phase was between 2010 and 13, so the first two bailout agreements. And then we decided uh, well, to be consistent and continue. But it is, uh, it, it raises some challenges uh, because, and I'm glad you brought it up, because the two newspapers that Tanea uh, and Kathmerni, as I said, in this phase do not, um, uh, well, not support the Syriza government and try to undermine its position. And it would be good also, yes, to have a newspaper that more clearly uh, supports the Syriza positions. And it is one of the limitations, one way to overcome it, and I didn't have time to discuss it now. If you remember, we had the different uh, levels of analysis, which is artificial, actually. Um, in, in our text because we are now trying to uh, write uh, a book about it, we do bring in the, the media environment uh, and we do address these limitations. But yes, it, it, there is a limitation. And on the other hand, uh, one could argue why only mainstream media? It's not because we have uh, alternative media or non-commercial media that do uh, articulate different discourses. This is not the entirety. This is not necessarily how uh, the Greek uh, society uh, well, uh, understands or interprets these issues. Because there is also the difference between what they read and what they experience in their everyday lives. And there are significant differences. Right? Uh, also, what is very interesting, uh, of course, the media in Greece are in crisis, they have been in crisis, but even more so the past year. The financial crisis really did a lot of damage. Newspapers had their closed or changed owners, etc., etc. Uh, so it doesn't help quality journalism. Um, and it is interesting to see how these, the leading media, failed to report accurately, uh, not only in relation to whether they take an ideological position or not, but, for example, uh, when Syriza, in, nine, uh, in 2015, I don't know if you had followed, if you, if you remember, 
decided to go for a referendum if we would accept the terms of, of the bailout agreement as, as it was then or not. And the, because the, the elites of the country freaked out that because there was discussion we will leave the, the, the Eurozone and there will be uh, financial destruction. Uh, and the entire system pushed really hard into, uh, they took a position and all the leading media took a position. And even there were, even scientists were involved in predicting what will happen with the, the, uh, the referendum. Everybody predicted no, that no, it will, uh, yes, will prevail. And no prevailed by 67, 60. And, and it, was, it was impressive because the media, two experts, right? Uh, media experts, political experts, who had, uh, talking about predictions presented as facts, uh, supposedly they were doing the research and um, they had different polls and, uh, and these kinds of uh, well, methods used uh, to see what the Greek people would do. And uh, all the leading media, these included, said, no, uh, it won't be so sticking to the agreement uh, would prevail. And it didn't by a big difference. And everybody, I don't know if they actually believed it or if it was completely constructed, maybe both. But then you wake up and there is a completely different reality than the one that they were uh, reporting on for weeks. So there are limitations and even if we would take, you know, all them, let's say, the mainstream media still, there would be uh, <coughs> media missing, uh, let's say, the, the non-mainstream, because Avgi is taking, a, is a mainstream newspaper, right, taking a position, is supporting now, of course, if more than in the past, since it's, a, it's a governmental, right, supporting the, the government. Uh, so I think it is important to, as much as we can to acknowledge our limitations as researchers and I mean as scientists, because we cannot study everything at the same time, but we should not be blind to the restrictions. It is important. Uh, there was some other question. Second one, how did you manage uh, the great number of uh, articles on the Greek crisis? Because the newspapers were not writing about anything else. Uh, for what I presented, there was a selection of directly related to the bailout agreement, selection of uh, 150 articles. But we had previous studies, uh, framing analysis, which had both quantitative and qualitative analysis. There, uh, we had through systematic random sampling. So we would find everything. So first, we determined periods around the bailout agreements. Uh, then we would find everything through the electronic archive. Yes. It, would take a while. For example, uh, in relation, let's say, to the first and the second bailout agreement, first, even taking out, you know, uh, opinion articles and cle cleaning the sample, we were left with, I think, 2,500. And from that, um, through the logics of the lowest number of articles in one of our, the periods that we examined, we ended up for the framing analysis in around 600 or 580, something like that. Um, but this involves a number of decisions that we uh, make uh, as researchers, and they might influence uh, to a large degree even the outcome, right? So we should be very conscious of any biases, even in well, yeah, what media we select to study, but also what sample, right? We, uh, we use what, what material we analyze. Um, at that time, I was working with three other researchers, so we had long discussions. And I had long discussions with other um, colleagues. Uh, also with Nico, I think I have been harassing him uh, about these issues for quite some time, uh, regarding these issues as well. Uh, so we do hope, because it wasn't one person's choice only, and as I said, we had long discussions, and uh, uh, we gave up ideas that we had in the beginning because we saw they didn't work, uh, that uh, we left uh, a number of our biases out.
but we are human. Can I? Yes. <laughs> In the pictures, you use Ferrofakis a lot. It's very visible. Uh, I'm not going to mention Dazzle Blue, the other guy. Uh, yeah, two interesting people. Um, <laughs> So, but the fact is very present in, in the uh, non-Greek press that has been covering uh, the Greek economic crisis, I would argue that the way he's represented is basically the villain. Uh, and I'm mostly curious how that fits in, into your model. Uh, of course, you can use Tushman's, uh, and in particular the combination part, which I think aligns well. But I would argue you have something like vilification. And then you use narrative theory. Yes. That's how you frame the analysis of this balance between objectivity and, uh, and, and narrative logics. And I would argue that, in, at least in the, uh, the non Greek press, vilification plays a very significant role because a lot of the coverage is centered around Vanifakis, who's seen as an idiot. Yep. Basically, that's the way it's represented. And we, can, yes. we can argue yes. <laughs> about the reality or materiality of that now, so I have my doubts there. Um, but he's, that vilification logic is very, very important, which is a variation of condemnation. It's not exactly the same. I would argue. So, the question is how do you see that in, in the Greek material? Because I think that must be different. To some degree, but not entirely. Uh, but also, then the theoretical question is how does qualification work? How would you see that, in, especially in, in, in these more regulation dimensions? Mm. Um, well, Var the Varfakis case is interesting because he was a bit atypical. And I think in the beginning, both okay, the other European actors, but also the media didn't know exactly. Uh, how to deal with, uh, with him. Um, it is interesting, well, maybe I should have put uh, one quote of Varoufakis because we have it in our text. Uh, he's charismatic and of course he used his charisma and he, he's using himself very much uh, value laden so moralization is everywhere. He combines the numbers, quantification and moralization. It is, it is interesting and of course if you start reading carefully, sometimes the things that he says don't make much sense, but they have an emotional appeal, uh, impact. And I think in the beginning also, uh, the leading media didn't know, didn't know exactly uh, how to deal uh, with, uh, well, a political actor who is a bit different than the other. Uh, to make it a bit more complicated to add to what you're saying, as you may be remember if you have followed, soon after the referendum and the agreement that actually, the third bailout actually, that Syriza uh, decided and agreed on with the creditors, Varoufakis left the government. And now he has been, what do you call it, the, the, the verb of making a, vi a villain? <laughs> well, it sounds a bit, yeah. Uh, by Syriza, of course, because Syriza after that well, has uh, agreed on harsh neoliberal uh, measures and has been implementing them, right? So he is a, a part of their innocent past and that they had overestimated, of course, their capacity. And uh, he, at that time he was a central actor. Uh, the, what the Greek, at least these two, two newspapers did is that they would try to counter uh, his arguments uh, and his discourse with that of other actors who would say that uh, uh, despite harmless, is arrogant, is not realistic. Uh, so th they would either use uh, at that time uh, actors from the opposition and the other political party. So, so, so that it's not the, the journalists themselves who would say that, but they would put the, the sources, right, to uh, deliver. Uh, but they, I think, especially you would see it in the opinion pieces, some of the, the journalists were freaked out also. 
you, you can understand it, one, different style is one thing, but there was for months this, you know, uh, uncertainty, oh my God, we will leave the, the Eurozone, the Grexit, the famous Grexit, we would believe that soon after, we wouldn't have a Grexit, but a Brexit, but, uh, and actually there were discussions with Soibel, he had proposed that, that uh, they would give some money to Greece for a while, that he leaves, uh, the Eurozone, and then if it is, you know, it behaves well or if its economy stabilizes, it will come back. Um, but he would also play differently than the other uh, political actors, I mean, with the creditors. And this is why, yes, he was framed as our, an arrogant bastard by, by some of them. Um, I, we haven't studied explicitly how, in terms of narrative theory, how the different actors uh, were, um, the roles that they were related to. Uh, trying to think, what are the, the typical? Uh, the other is the hero, of course. But the hero is I think you would see both. You would see both. But always, at least these media uh, were distrusting towards Syriza, especially the first period. There was huge concern in the entire uh, political system and economic system that what are these stupid people doing will be destroyed. And uh, the period, especially around the memorandum, was really, really tense. And how the Greek people would uh, position themselves. It was very, uh, it even started reminding times, the times of the civil war. It was really, really tense, yes. I think I have answered your question. What, uh, but it is true that especially uh, in uh, when these kinds of things are covered by the media of another country, they focus too much on the person. Uh, so uh, during that time, it was about either Merkel or Schäuble at the time, that uh, the negotiations. Of course, he was one of the leading actors, right? The uh, minister of the German minister of finance, but he was not the only one. As uh, the same with uh, Varoufakis in relation to the Greek side. But it is easier for media to identify a guy a person, an actor, a uh, guy, sorry, I use the lift man, um, and uh, relay the entire policy and the entire discourse and the entire ideological position around one person, which is, is, is a simplification, of course. Maybe I will have a question a little aside your research, but uh, you were talking about authority and uh, the journalists, and I'm interested in authority of journalists in Greece. Because uh, we know here how the president is fighting against and so on, so the position as a pro of profession here is not in the public space uh, higher. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what, what about in Greece, and especially if this uh, crisis helped to this some, somehow, or if it made if it made better or worse? So I don't know what's what's the position of people as a profession? Well, it weakened, yes, it weakened uh, very much the, the, the role. Uh, media were shut down, uh, a lot of journalists lost their, their jobs. Of course, this is not only related to the crisis, but the crisis made things much worse because the media in Greece had always been you know, in close connection with the political system. And you had a lot of media, uh, uh, which were not and are not viable in commercial terms based on their circulation or advertising revenue, uh, but because they get subsidized either through advertising from the, or other ways through the, the government. And unfortunately, maybe one could say that the crisis was an opportunity of sanitization, talking about moralizing discourse, but things became worse. And now, in terms of uh, how clearly the media take position and how they try to fight each other. I don't remember this since the 80s. You have a media and you, I don't, 
and, and uh, Syriza's uh, involvement in that has been critical. They're highly populist, and they try to uh, uh, use strategies that we hadn't seen for decades, and this uh, pushed the entire system into, uh, you know, uh, they, they are fighting through some newspapers and through some media, and, it, uh, and they do it much more openly than in the past. Uh, but in terms of the journalists, the position of journalists, there's no, there are some small alternative media, but there's not much space for how many journalists can work there. And there are a lot of media online only, uh, who use unethical tactics either to attack opponents, political opponents, uh, supposedly in the, in the name of, uh, not investigative journalists, how we call it, expose, how we call it, not, how would we call it? It's not, it is in the name of investigative journalism, but it is about, you know, uh, taking the laundry, as we call it, the dirty laundry of the political opponents out, and they try to dig in and see also in relation to their families, if they have uh, offshore companies abroad and what other activities they have. And now uh, the, the, uh, uh, this relates to the opposition. So the, the media that support the series are uh, sad wars about uh, specific uh, persons of the opposition and their families, but also the opposition does the same. And it is an open war. It doesn't help quality of journalism. Um, after uh, some big media were bankrupt, uh, one closed completely, and uh, uh, the biggest television station and one print, uh, uh, one company that had a number of newspapers, websites, and other media was uh, bought by somebody else. But this meant uh, uh, lay, uh, that a lot of journalists lost their job. They kept a few, and the quality of journalism change to the world, unfortunately. In what we call mainstream media landscape, at least. Well, thank you for your time, attentiveness, and patience. Thank you. Well, to the audience as well, yeah, thank you. <laughs>